This was the Hittite civilization. They were a civilization back in the Bronze Age, before the ancient Greeks and the Persians, and for some reason I find them really interesting. So today I want to tell you a story about them, the story of how we managed to decipher their forgotten language. Because you see, the Hittites had learned writing from the Sumerians that lived uh, around this area in Mesopotamia. And they also had contact with Egyptians that lived farther than south. And they actually used to send a lot of letters to the governments of these nations. And so, because of reasons of diplomacy and war and economy, stuff like that. And so, we have a ton of writing examples of Hittite language. In fact, whenever we go to, the, to their cities, the ruins of their cities, we often find many government buildings that still have a lot of written documents. But here's the thing. The Hittites learned writing from the Sumerians, and the Sumerians had all of these symbols that they used to represent specific sounds. And so the Hittites simply took these symbols for sounds and used them for the sounds of their language. The problem was that this resulted in archaeologists being able to know how they should pronounce these, these writings, but not what they meant. For example, it's like when today we write Japanese with uh, Latin characters. For example, I can say, I can write Kimi no Nawa. And sure, you can see this phrase, you can read it, you can pronounce it, and if a Japanese speaker heard it, they will probably tell you that you are pronouncing it more or less correctly, but you have no idea what it means. Or well, maybe you know that this means your name, but like you don't know the grammar. And so the, the archaeologists uh, that when, start, when they started discovering the ruins of the Hittites were in a very similar situation. So they could read the, the, the text, they could know how they sounded, but not what they meant. And here is where we find this guy. His name was that uh, it's in Czech, he was from, from Czech Republic, and well, Czech Republic didn't exist back then, but <laughs> uh, his name was like Bedrich Hrnrosi, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing it correctly, but he was an archaeologist, and he was very smart, and he was the one that deciphered the Hittite language, this is how he did it. He was looking at this phrase, and he knew that it, that it was pronounced Nuninda An Eisateni, Wada ar ma ekuteni. But he obviously had no idea what it meant. Uh, but then, then he noticed this. An. And then he remembered that in German, you often use the letter N to indicate the accusative. For example, the, the phrase, uh, let me write it. For example, in German, the phrase I eat the apple is ich esse den Apfel. Usually, ap uh, apple, the apple in German is the Apfel. But when the apple is the subject of an action, in this case being eaten, then uh, you change this R for an N. And, and so this looked awfully similar to what was happening here. What if this is an accusative ending, like in German? And then he looked at this word, eisateni. First off, look at this, teni, teni. So we have two words, eisateni and ekuteni, that have the same ending. First of all, this reminds me of verbs, because, you know, well, in English, you can have things like this. Sarah jumps, Jimmy smiles. Here, both verbs end with an S to indicate that both of these verbs are in the present tense and that they are both done by what we call the third, th the third person, either he, she or it. Uh, other languages that have more complex verb morphology uh, do similar things. For example, in Spanish, you could see things like comemos or pudimos. 
And this MOS ending means that it is done by we. It is done by the first person plural. And so Bedrich looked at these endings and he guessed that, well, these were probably verbs. But what verbs they were? Well, eisateni. Huh. Well, remember our German phrase, ich esse den Apfel? Doesn't the word essen, which means eat in German, seem similar to you to eisateni? They even wrote it with a double uh, s sound. Like if you look at the, at the original one uh, here, uh, here, you can see that they had one syllable that ended with, an, with a s sound and then another that started with that, which is very similar to what German people still do. So could it be that this root ASA meant to eat? Well, that was very likely because turns out that, well, uh, Bedrich knew Sumerian, and in Sumerian, the word ninda means bread. So it could be that this was a borrowing, that the Hittites were writing the word bread with the same word that the Sumerians. This is something that happens with civilizations influence each other. They sometimes uh, borrow words from other civilizations. So if this is bread, and this is it, so maybe something about eating bread. Okay, makes sense. But then what about this? Wadar. Doesn't it sound familiar to you? Wadar? Water. Water. It sounds very similar. Wadar, water. So if you eat bread, what do you do with water? Well, you drink it. So could it be that this phrase meant something like eat bread and drink water? But wait, 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 wait a second. Look, look at what, I mean, I, I imagine that at this point, Bredrich had to think to himself, man, think what you are proposing. You are proposing that the Hittites, these people that used to live here in Anatolia, in Anatolia, somehow their language is related to German and English, to Germanic languages? Does that even make sense? Well, he started looking at ancient Germanic languages, looking for similarities between uh, the, the words in those ancient languages and the Hittite language, and, and he found many, many similarities. And eventually, linguists were able to use this connection to eventually decipher the entire Hittite language. And this is what this uh, phrase really meant. It meant, now, this is the new, now you will eat bread. Then, and ma is then, then you will drink water. Isn't that cool? They, they, they managed to decipher this language just by using just their reasoning and just some educated guesses. Uh, but at, okay, at this point, you're probably thinking like, how do we know that this is not a coincidence? Like there are many languages with similar words that are not related to each other. And well, Maybe I'd make a video about that uh, some other day. But what you do in these cases is that you take text that have never been seen before, like from a new archaeological site, and then you send pictures of this new, new text to different archaeologists so that they will translate them independently. And if they reach the same translations, and if the translations make sense, uh, well, then you can be fairly certain. Like it, like maybe by coincidence, you can translate a few words but you cannot use coincidence to translate correctly uh, and, and every text. And if it's coincidence, like eventually people are going to translate them in different ways. But all the archaeologists that learn Hittite uh, were translating these texts in exactly the, the, the same ways. And, and, they are, and they always make sense. So anyway, so that's, that's amazing. So this, <laughs> this man, this was evidence that these people living in, in Anatolia had migrated 
from somewhere in the north and let me <laughs> they had migrated from somewhere in the north they came here south and they prospered and eventually some other people not exactly their descendants but their relatives in the humanity family tree uh, continued to, to survive and prosper in Europe and they eventually well became the, the Saxons and, and the German peoples and I don't know and, and I find it very interesting how we were finally able to, to read this language and we went and when we were able to read it we found well, well first we found many beer, beer recipes actually this phrase the first phrase that Bredrich managed to translate this was actually part from a from a bed from a beer recipe uh, and we also found a lot of boring government documents about uh, about taxes about dealing with with wild lions and stuff like that but we also found amazing things like the first autobiography like the first time a person wrote the history of their lives and it was written by the king Hattusili the uh, third actually I have a video about that uh, actually I'm gonna put it here at the end of the video a link here so that you can watch it and uh, we also find for example there was a king that in his deathbed, like as he was dying, he changed his will and he set his son and his daughter-in-law in house arrest and declared that his grandson would be the new king. And I don't know, it's very dramatic uh, to read that document. But yeah, that, 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 that happened. And, and I don't know, it's, it's so cool. And I, I don't know, I just find this whole thing very interesting. Uh, and I hope you did too. And I hope you learned a little about how we translate so we decipher ancient languages because it's a topic that I find endlessly fascinating. And well, thanks for watching.